Good evening, you're watching News Always on This is Castle. Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is meeting for the first time in history. It is the moment all have been waiting for, known to many as the historic summit. This marks the first time a US sitting president comes face to face with a North Korean leader. Denuclearization will be obviously a massive topic. Trump once dubbed Kim Little Rocket Man and threatened fire and fury against his regime, but has expressed optimism about potential deal with North Korea on denuclearization. He said, quote, I just think it's going to work out very nicely, but he has also said he is prepared to walk away from the table if talks are not fruitful. Last week, Trump said he plans to address human rights human rights too. The president told reporters before depart departing for the G7 summit saying, quote, we will bring it up. Here's what you need to know about human rights in North Korea. According to watchdog agencies, human rights groups and the US government, North Korea has perpetuated human rights abuses for decades. A 2014 report from the United States United Nations Human Rights Council Commission found that the authoritarian regime has committed systematic, widespread and gross human rights violations, including arbitrary detention, torture, executions and enforced disappearance to political prison camps, violation of the freedom of thought, expression and religion, and discrimination on the basis of state assigned social class, gender and disability. One case Trump can, brought up, can bring up would be the American who died after 17 months detention in North Korea, Otto Wambier. Over the weekend, Vice President Mike Pence said he had spoken with Wambier's father recently and that Trump was going into the summit with the family of Otto Wambier on his heart. And if you're wondering who's going to be at the summit other than Mr. Trump and Mr. Kim, here are the lists from NPR News. Let's begin with the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. Pompeo was a Kansas congressman and harsh critic of the Obama administration's nuclear deal with Iran. He has played a key role in setting the stage for Trump's meeting with Kim Jong-un when he traveled twice to Pyongyang to pave his way for this summit. Once as CIA director and soon after he was confirmed as Secretary of State, both times meeting with Kim. In those trips, he tries to convince North Korean officials that they have a bright future, but only if they give up on their nuclear weapons. Moving on, we have John Bolden. He's President Trump's national security advisor. He has a long history of friction with North Korea. Bolden was sharp critic as President George W. Bush representative to the United Nations in year 2005 to 2006. He has called for a regime change. And last month, Bolden caused a steer where he suggested North Korea could follow the Libya model to dismantle its nuclear program. Given this history, he's expected to keep a relatively low profile at the summit. Next up, we have John Kelly. He is President Trump's second chief of staff and has served in that position for more than 10 months. Kelly was a retired Marine Corps general and Trump's Secretary of Homeland Security. Joe Hagen. Joe Hagen is the White House Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations, also known as the White House Point Person for the Submit. He has been leading a team in Singapore that is arranging logistics for today's meeting. Previously, he served in the George W. Bush administration as the Deputy Chief of Staff. Next up, we have Alison Hooker. Hooker joined National Security Council in year 2014, and she's a former State Department official who specialized in current affairs during President Obama's administration. She has remained on the NSC under President Trump and is the council's point person on North Korea. Though she's a low-key figure, she has experience in high-profile diplomacy. In 2004, she accompanied James Clapper, then the Director of National Intelligence to North Korea, to win the release of two American detainees. Next, we have Sung Kim. The U.S. Ambassador to the Philippines was born in South Korea and returned there as a U.S. Ambassador in year 2011. He is one of the rare Korea Foreign Services officers playing a high-profile role in this year's summit planning. Kim avoids the limelight and has been quietly negotiating the agenda for the summit with the North Korean delegation in the demilitarized zone, trying to iron out what sort of commitments North Korea is ready to make on denuclearization and what steps the US might take toward formally ending the Korean War. 
Next up, we have Andrew Kim. Growing up in South Korea before moving to the United States, he retired from the CIA last year after Mike Pompeo persuaded him to come back and head the agency's newly established Korea Mission Center. Since then, Kim has been a high-profile presence in US-North Korea contacts. He traveled with Pompeo twice for meetings in North Korea with Kim Jong-un. And then we have Lee Hsien Long. He's Singapore's Prime Minister since 2004. He's the son of the founding father of modern Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, who is also the man credited with making an economic powerhouse. The younger Lee was educated at Britain's University of Cambridge and Harvard University. Serving the army before entering politics, Lee and his father have now led Singapore for 39 of his 53 years of independence. The city-state is extremely prosperous and politically stable, but faces criticisms for its strict laws, limited press freedom, and extended political control by one family. Ri Yong-ho Ri Yong-ho often referred to as soft-spoken and polite. Ri is North Korea's foreign minister and longtime negotiator. He made waves last fall when he called President Trump, quote, President Evil at the UN General Assembly last fall, also threatening to test a hydrogen bomb above the Pacific. Moving on, we have Kim Yong Chol, a regime insider. He's the vice chair of North Korea's ruling, ruling Workers' Party and the country's former spy chief. He is also considered Kim Jong Un's right hand man. He served all three generations of the ruling Kim dynasty and has involved in key no negotiations with South Korea. Because of his suspected involvement in the 2010 torpedoing of a South Korean naval vessel and the 2014 hacking against Sony, Kim is sanctioned by the United States. However, he received a waiver to visit the White House to meet with President Trump in the run up to the Singapore summit. And finally, the last person to be in submit in Singapore today is Koi Sun Hyu. She is the North Korea's Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs and the point person on North Korea's relations with the United States. As an experienced diplomat and former English, English language interpreter, she was involved in the six party talks and other high level North Korean diplomacy with the US, including in year 2009 when former President Bill Clinton visited North Korea. Last month, she called Vice President Pence a political dummy. Phew. That was indeed a long list. Now, up next, we'll take a look at the schedule from today from the White House. Um, right now, it's 8.49. Uh, looks like we are about 10 minutes away, according to the schedule from White House, from the big moment where Mr. Trump and Mr. Kim will be greeting each other at 9.15 local time in the morning. Both of the leaders will be expected to participate in a one-on-one -on -one bilateral meeting till 11.30 a.m. Followed and then followed by that, they will have a working lunch. Looks like that's all the time we have for now. For more on this, stay tuned to our channel and don't forget to click the subscribe button. For news always on, I'm Castle and I'll see you later.